Chuck Underwood's Generations is made possible in part by United Healthcare, providing a full spectrum of resources and services which help people attain improved health and well-being. Information on healthcare is available at uhc.com. Those of you who were born in America between the late 1920s and the early 1940s have been labeled the silent generation. You are the kids who went through your formative years during the post-war era of 1946 to 62. You are considered our nation's last innocent generation. I read a recent article about you women. It was called The Last Good Girls. The two authors who are the leading experts on the subject of America's generations say that the silence are exerting an enormous influence over American history. But interestingly, you are the only generation who doesn't realize that. Their names are Bill Strauss and Neil Howe. They were both born and raised on the West Coast, Ivy League educated on the East Coast. They have authored four colossal books on the subject of America's generations. They are the world's leading experts on them. Bill Strauss, get us started here so we don't leave anybody behind. What is it that creates a generation? Chuck, a generation is created by history. A generation is approximately 20 years of birth years. For example, in the 20th century, we had five generations born. We had the GI generation born from 1901 to 1924. We had the subject of today's show, the silent generation, born from 1925 to 1942. We had boomers born from 1943 to 1960. We had Gen Xers born from 1961 to 1981. And we had millennials, today's children and teens, born from 1982 through now. Neil Howe, give us a portrait of the, the character of the silent generation and how they're different in their personality and beliefs from the other generations. Well, Bill put it just right. This is a generation that was born just too late to be war heroes and just too early to be youthful free spirits during the consciousness revolution. But they've done very well, most of them, in the economy. They got just on the post-war escalative prosperity just after the war was over when they were young people. Uh, Woody Allen, you know, says 80% of life is just showing up. And for a lot of this generation, compared with their boomer and exer kids, that's true. Uh, this is the generation probably of the best behaved and most sheltered children of the 20th century. This is the generation that got married on average and had kids on average at a younger age than any other generation in American history. A lot of the things that the boomers take credit for, the silent generation actually did. They were the great civil rights generation. They were the ones who invented rock and roll. They were the ones who brought us feminism and environmentalism. And you remember back during the Vietnam War, the radicalism really was of the silent. You had the Chicago 7 and all these different numbered groups who were getting prosecuted. Those weren't boomers, those were silent. You think of the consciousness revolution as three generations. The GIs who were offended, the silent, many of them were leading it, and the boomers providing the passion and the mass behind it. Bill and Neil are both boomers. Look on stage closely. This is one of the few times that you will see silence outnumbering boomers. <laughs> <laughs> Julia Maxton, president of a regional chamber of commerce, she calls herself a chambermaid. <laughs> when, oh, when we first silent. called Julia, she said, I am the typical white silent generation female, meaning what? Well, I was born in 1940. I remember my parents coming out of the war years. Uh, we had plenty of money, but nothing to buy at that time. And then as I grew up, I remember my mother always dressed in heels and hose around the house, even doing housework, a little cardigan set and a skirt. During the war, her hose might be in shreds, but she had hose on. And of course, I'm the last good girl of my generation because I was a virgin when I was married at 21. <laughs> Dr. John Henderson is the president of what is considered a national treasure, Wilberforce University, just outside of Dayton, Ohio. Give us some sense, John, of the upbringing of a typical black, silent male, in your case, in the Midwest. In my upbringing, uh, there was an old adage that children should be seen and not heard. And uh, I, I think for me, uh, that certainly typified uh, uh, somewhat being in the background, on the sideline, and that sort of a thing. I grew up in a period where there was still a good bit of segregation, uh, segregated schools, uh, segregated movies, uh, and those kinds of things. Uh, not, no access to 
restaurants to the extent that we have uh, today. Uh, so the community was very narrowly uh, uh, defined during that period of time. As it turns out, you learned much later in life, you were born just a few miles from Dr. Murtis Powell, who is currently the Vice President for Student Affairs at Miami University, the typical female silent upbringing in the deep south of Alabama. At that time, we were not uh, thinking about rock and roll or any of those things. Uh, I graduated from, <clears throat> graduated from high school uh, one year, 1955, after the Supreme Court decision on desegregation. So uh, I experienced the, the segregated water fountains and the things that John is talking about in Evergreen, Alabama. Uh, I came uh, to Cincinnati at that time to go to college, and I remember the segregation uh, here in the Midwest that was supposed to be the land uh, that we thought uh, that was much different than the South, but found that it was much, much, much like the South at that time. Uh, but it was also an exciting time. There was a lot of hope. Uh, of uh, things that were possible. Uh, and so it was a time when um, there was also the sadness, but we were leaving one era and going into another. Nick Clooney is a decorated broadcast journalist and print journalist, former news anchor in cities such as Los Angeles and Cincinnati, news director. He's authored a couple of books. Uh, he currently hosts a very popular morning radio show in Cincinnati and still finds time to write how many columns a week for the Cincinnati Post three of them, one of which is worth reading. <laughs> it's not a bad average in baseball. I hope it's as good in <laughs> Nick, as you were coming of age, did the men of the GI generation cast an enormous shadow over the men of the silent? Indeed. I, I like to think, and I, I believe this to be true, that the Second World War was the central fact of the 20th century. Things flowed up to it. Things flowed away from it, cultural, racial, and, uh, and having to do with national uh, politics, government. And uh, I must say that I, I do take issue with our two very articulate and uh, very talented experts here today. The generation just didn't seem silent to me, not as I was growing up in it. It was pretty noisy. It started with the Korean War, the 25th of June in uh, 1950 started. Ended with the U-2 incident. In between, we had Brown versus the Board of Education. We had McCarthy. We had the start of the real civil rights movement in the South. A friend of mine, Forever and Fred Shuttlesworth, was blown out of his house in 1957, Birmingham, Alabama. The uh, rock and roll. Rock and roll had an enormous cultural reality, which let us know that there was a new youth culture. Always had been a youth culture in the United States of America, but they never had any money until this time. So that youth culture started to take, uh, make a real impact, it seems to me, on society because they could buy the records. Before our two boomers surrounded by silence get bludgeoned to death, <laughs> how many of you who are silence think that the silent label fits? Please raise your hand. How many don't Absolutely. think you're silent at all? <laughs> well, doesn't that beg the question, where in the hell did the silent name come from? <laughs> the silent Chuck, name. Chuck, let me, let me make clear. The silent name, like a name to a lot of generations, like the lost generation who came of age in the 1920s, refers not to where they ended up, it refers to where they started. And most generations end up at a very different place from where they started. In the 1950s, the premium was on fitting in, getting along, doing your duty, not speaking up. And the two big problems by the end of the 1950s were the end of ideology and too much conformity in America. And that wasn't because we had a lot of kids who were speaking their own minds. I think no one would have said that at the end of the 1960s. That's where they started, but that's not where they are today. In fact, the silent generation has spent much of its lifetime reacting against and breaking out of that box. To what extent did black America share in the victory of World War II? Did uh, you feel a piece of the triumph, or did you view it as a, a white American victory? Although you had a segregated military, uh, I think the exploits of uh, uh, the, the 99th uh, Fighter Squadron, uh, y y you know, we had, uh, uh, there was a major bomber squadron that uh, uh, had tremendous, tremendous victories during, during that period. Uh, some of the major uh, battles uh, were achieved by black fighting men. And I think that the attitude was that uh, they indeed had a, had a stake uh, in America. Uh, when, when they returned, 
Uh, of course, you had a, a good bit of disappointment because of the still uh, segregated conditions within this country, and I think that those were some of the things that helped to foment the uh, civil rights movement. I remember <clears throat> relatives, uncles, and what have you, serving. It was a very patriotic time for African Americans in the, in, the, in the country, for blacks in the South also. It was sense that uh, surely if we fought together and fought for the country, things would be better. Uh, and so I can remember uh, being proud to see and how proud we were and my grandparents and my father and mother uh, to see the soldiers come home and uh, we celebrated that and we were very hopeful at that time. Uh, but to I remember the disappointments, however, uh, when they did come home and the opportunities that one had fought for were not there. Okay. Where did the conformity and the conservatism so famous for the 1950s come from? In uh, uh, 1949, Fortune magazine came out with a famous cover saying that the class of 49 is taking no chances. There was a perception back in the early 50s especially that America was producing young conformists, young corporatists who were blending in very seamlessly into the suburban society that the older GI generation veterans were settling into. Julia? Uh, we were sent to college, the women, uh, with the expectation that we would find a man and we would begin a married life. And I can remember freshman week at my college, uh, a lot of time was spent with the men uh, developing their majors and they were given all kinds of tests to see where their uh, abilities lie. And really, the women were either told to get into elementary education or take a liberal arts degree, and nobody really cared too much about what we studied because we weren't even expected to graduate. And uh, when I did graduate, um, I really didn't have a good degree. It was a liberal arts thing. You know, I took fencing and horseback riding, but my <laughs> goodness, you know, I had a great time. The silent generation were the most married women in American history, and they were also the ones who later invented the status cloaking Ms. label to, to bring out the feminism that uh, we associated with the 1960s. Neil, you and Bill wrote that amid all this extreme conservatism and extreme conformity came the inevitable extreme backlash that produced some great minds out of this generation in the creative arts. Explain that. Well, remember that the silent generation, be, almost because of all that early conformity, when they hit the late 60s and early 70s, they invented something called the midlife crisis, right? Almost everyone, Gail Sheehan, who <laughs> writes about the midlife crisis, comes from the silent generation. It comes from that sense, you didn't take enough chances early, so you gotta take them a little bit later. Do you remember the Bob Dylan quote, I was older then, I'm younger than that now. That right. It's a very silent generation attitude. Or the Elvis Presley line, I've spent a lifetime waiting for the right time. Boomers never waited for anything, you know? When they wanted it, they just took it. Um, so that was a silent generation, and it led to a lot of risk-taking creativity in this generation later in life, in their 40s, 50s, 60s, even today. Well, go back to the 50s, because I think you guys write that it was, it was that backlash against the conservatism that gave us people like George Carlin. Yes. And writers and psychologists all yes. as a recoil from the conservatism. It felt very thrilling for the silent to stand up in a coffee house in San Francisco and shout one dirty word. <laughs> <laughs> and now, today, you look at what the culture has become in the movies and the TV shows, and there are a lot of members of the silent generation who don't look at that with much favor, but they have to think back to their own days. They felt like they were breaking some barriers by having just a little bit of sexuality, a little bit of violence, a little bit of vulgarity, uh, when, when, in fact, those were all very new things coming out of the post-war era. Julie, I'd like to ask you, what was the race message handed down to white silent females? And Nick will ask you about white silent males as you came of age in the post-war era. Um, it was not even considered. Um, I was not allowed to date uh, any other faith than Protestant, Lutheran, pr preferably. Uh, never any interracial affiliations, drive a General Motors car. I mean, it was just kind of... <laughs> wow, that's loyalty. It was really laid out. Nick, how much anger was associated with the separation? Did your parents instill in you an anger against blacks, or was it just keep an arm's distance? Uh, I had none of that experience. It was not a quiet time. It was a loud time. I was raised in the Mid-South, right in the middle of segregation. Uh, we had the 
double uh, bathrooms and the, uh, the quadruple water fountains, and we had all of that. Uh, nonetheless, what I was aware of was a burgeoning of things. Perhaps it's because my family eventually was in the arts and always was interested in singing and, and uh, popular music and that sort of thing. And uh, American blacks were at the center of the, of the life that I liked and wanted to lead and that uh, my family liked and wanted to lead. So that uh, when, for instance, my grandmother would never, although we were in Kentucky, my grandmother who raised us would never allow any kind of epithet to come out of our mouths, or any vulgarity for that matter, and, uh, and she was pretty handy with uh, whatever was nearby <laughs> to make sure that I did that. One of the things that I was taught, and we were taught, that uh, to try to work within the system. So politeness, um, regardless of the circumstance you find yourself, was one of the things we were taught. I think you see that in the nonviolence movement in terms of uh, fight the civil rights movement. Nevertheless, that did not mean that you were subservient. And I remember how excited I was when I would, uh, even though I was young, uh, listen at what was happening in the Supreme Court, uh, Thurgood Marshall, um, how proud I was to have someone arguing for the rights, and how great, it, how I felt when I had an opportunity to march for that right. Uh, my mother particularly was always of the impression that uh, I had to work very hard, study very hard. Uh, but she tried to impress upon me very early on uh, that I had to be twice as good as any white youngster in order to uh, get any minimal type of opportunity. This comment before, though, I thought it was really good about working within the system, which really was almost a silent generation slogan. The GI generation with the New Deal and World War II and the H-bomb, they wanted to you know, replace or change the system. The silent generation wanted to work within it, and the boomers came along and just wanted to flatten it, right? Just get rid of it. <laughs> and that really is a, is, a, is a generational contrast, and I think it explains why the silent generation uniquely was such an absolutely outstanding civil rights generation. I mean, from Ralph Abernathy and Martin Luther King Jr. at one end, Jesse Jackson and, and Stokely Carmichael at the other end, Cesar Chavez, Russell Means, they're all in this generation because they still had faith in the system, but they thought they could improve it, whereas boomers came along and they didn't really trust right. the system any longer. <laughs> the boomers brought anger. The, bro the boomers brought riots, whereas the silent were trying to have everybody work together to get along. Question number one, in 1953, Playboy magazine made its debut. Its first edition featured nude photos of which 1950s sex symbol? Marilyn Monroe. Right. Yeah, I knew he'd know that. Marilyn Monroe. <laughs> <laughs> That's a guy thing. Notice I didn't put the microphone in front of her mouth. <laughs> Neil, give us a couple of bullet points. Give us a description of Generation X. Who are they? What do they stand for? What are they like? Well, the Generation X is born in the, the 1960s and 70s, from 1961 to 1981. Uh, their location in history is they were children during the Consciousness Revolution when boomers were entering adulthood. So they saw it from a totally different viewpoint. Uh, schools in chaos, crumbling families, economy going from rosy to dark. Uh, and it was a time of really a denigration of childhood in American life. It was actually a baby bus generation because people didn't even want to have kids. Uh, during the late 60s and early 70s. And they've had much more of a survivalist experience coming of age, particularly in the 80s and 90s. Uh, these were the, the throwaway kids, the latchkey kids. These were people having to make their way. I mentioned Judy Bloom earlier as sort of a, an icon or, or something that represents kids that were basically told, life is tough, you know, you're on your own. We're going to give you the tools to survive, but we really can't protect you anymore like we were protected. In fact, it's even better that you're not protected. That was a mistake with us. Whichever generation you fit into, your public television station still needs your support to keep programs like Generations coming your way. We'll be back with more in a few minutes.
We now return to Chuck Underwood's Generations, The Silence. Chuck Underwood's Generations is made possible in part by United Healthcare providing a full spectrum of resources and services which help people attain improved health and well-being. Information on health care is available at UHC.com. In capital letters, more than one author has called the silent generation, are you ready, the most sexually frustrated generation. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. And the <laughs> argument is... <laughs> right now. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. No question. I got I that. Well, Nick volunteers. Yeah. I got that. No I got that. No question. Yeah. Well, Chuck, really? actually, back in the 1970s, there were sex surveys taken of people of different age brackets, and the one age bracket that was getting more sex then than had been true 20 years ago was the silent, especially yeah. males. Where was I? Where was I? <laughs> I don't know whether you're exceptions or not, but that was so. I had a nervous breakdown in college because I was trying so hard. I said, you know, I'm away from home and I've got to do what I was expected. And I did. I literally blew my cork because I was to maintain this virginity thing. And then let me tell you, after I was married 20 years and got divorced, I made up for it big time. <laughs> there we go. Vir virginity <laughs> caused you to blow your cork. <laughs> I want to read that book. Interesting afterwards. image. <laughs> What, who? <laughs> but you see, the sexual revolution came along during the same years for all generations. In the case of the silent, it came along when you were in your 30s. For boomers, it came along at a fairly convenient time, when boomers were in their teens into their early 20s. For the case of uh, Generation Xers, it came along at the worst possible time, and that is when they were small children. And as a consequence, there were a lot of divorces that affected them. Chuck, I know during, uh, during uh, my uh, period in high school and college, I know there was a lot of talk about it. I mean, the guys talked about it, and, uh, and, and they bragged, and a lot of them bragged about it, but when it came down to uh, the actual truth, you know, not a whole heck of a lot was going, going on, you know, because, uh, uh, because the girls uh, just weren't, uh, weren't cooperating during that period. Well, you know, you look at our silent generation here. Let's remember that in the 1950s, as automobiles exploded, this new invention, crept onto the American scene. Yeah, the back seat, who said that? Yeah, the big cars. How could you guys miss with those cars? Drive-in theaters. See all these sweet ladies here? Now, why were drive-in theaters instantly nicknamed passion pits? You know, were you really that sexually frustrated or have you just been pulling one over our eyes for 40 years? Well, the birth control pill had not been uh, marketed yet. Yeah. The boomers, you see, came along during that interval between the discovery of the birth control pill and the discovery of AIDS. Gen X came after, the silent before, and you can define the sexual revolution exactly in those terms. Murtis, one thing that's written, not to be too preoccupied with sex, but you can accuse me of that, I guess. Um, you were the first generation of teenagers to be bombarded with a lot of sexual stimuli television, first of all, movies got racier, skirts got a little shorter, sweaters got a little tighter, drive-in movie theaters, all of that, and, and yet the puritanical values held. And another thing, I need some help here. When did, when did two-piece swimming suits first hit? Anybody give me a year? When Annette turned 14. Okay. Sorry? <laughs> when Annette Funicello turned 14. Well, is that right? <laughs> how many, how many yeah, silent yeah. women have ever worn a two-piece bathing suit? Oh, cool. Really? There, we go. there, there was two people. Sometime in the 50s. How many silent women have worn a bikini? No. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Let me see that. Oh, gosh. <laughs> She brought the photo album. <laughs> 1947 cheesecake. There you go. We'll get a close shot of this later if we can't get it now. And I was so proud of that um, swimming suit because that's when they first came out. You know, Esther Williams. Well, now, not yes. everybody can see it, so describe yeah. what it is. What, okay. what? It is a one piece, but it fits so nice and tight, and it just was, felt so good to go swimming in it. <laughs> Esther Williams. Esther Williams. I, I, I took it into work. We have many vets. In our office, we have to hire so many vets. And I showed it to one of the 19-year-olds. He looked at it. He says, what kind of dress is that? <laughs> <laughs>
No silent generation woman has ever gone to a public beach that where nudity is permitted and gone topless. Oh yeah? What? Who said oh yeah? <laughs> Stan, please. Um, what is it? On the, in the Virgin Islands, I think it was Martinique, for the, which the St. Martinique, the, the French side, was topless. And some friends and I went over to see. We didn't go topless, but we went over to see, and we almost got stuck over there and couldn't get back to our ship, but, <laughs> but, but we didn't do it. Uh, oh, sure you didn't. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Nothing like driving the Parkmore Drive-In on a Friday night with a boyfriend with a new Bel Air convertible with the top down and rocking and rolling as you drove through. There was, that music just brought you to your toes. You, you heard the gentleman over here talk about the big back seats. Mm -hmm. For you ladies of the silent generation, was Saturday night just one big wrestling match in the back seat with your date? No, not really. Not really. <laughs> Did the men behave? Not really. <laughs> so, have they ever? Well, they, so, they so, I, I never had a had a had a chance to uh, enjoy some of that uh, uh, drive-in theater excitement because uh, we only had one one car, <laughs> and, and my old man wasn't about to let them. <laughs> you know, with uh, with with me, uh, because if anything happened to it, uh, then I was in real trouble. <laughs> change the subject when rock and roll music came along did it ease its way into popular music or did it come down like a meat cleaver and nick did you go to sleep one night listening to a sinatra love ballad and wake up the next morning to good golly miss molly i must tell you chuck in my case i was already a disc jockey and uh you know, in radio and it almost was what you just described and it was uh it was startling there had been some harbingers of what was coming up some big bands had been going into the uh the big beat night uh, night train and the ya ba da ba da ba da and there had been a couple of uh, bubblegum type tunes a fellow named uh, uh, Don Howard who did a song called Oh Have You it was a real uh, almost childish little uh, lament <laughs> no, don't, 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 don't. Oh, happy day. you know and I always said that's really stupid we, yeah. uh, where's Sinatra when I meet him you know of course it was the it was the harbinger of doo-wop and it was the harbinger of things to come and uh, believe me when shake rattle and roll smacked us right in the face and then all these one little Richard came popping out mm -hmm. there and all of these other Chuck Berry and this astounding music uh, which had of course uh, had its own niche for many, many years. R&B in those days, we should remember, meant race and blues, not rhythm and blues. Oh, it, it was crossover music. There was a very important <laughs> racial element. The people like oh, yeah. uh, uh, Elvis Presley on the one side and Chuck Berry on the other side were, were fusing aspects of, of white and black culture into Absolutely rock and right. roll. And of course, it had always, uh, that had always been true. Uh, the popular music was always an amalgam of, of those cultures. But in this case, it was a bar line thing. It was all of a sudden, smack you in the face. Don't think about the lyrics. Don't worry about the lyrics. They don't matter. It's, a, it's emotion. It's feeling. It's this is it, and, and it's a it's a bar line. Pow. There's a pretty good body of research that suggests that the basic values and beliefs that all of us form between the ages of 10 and 20 are the core values that we're going to take through our entire lives. The silent generation formed its core values during that period of conformity, conservatism, post-war euphoria, and very limited career opportunities for minorities and for women. And then the 60s hit, and many of those core values on which the silence had been raised were suddenly slaughtered by a new generation, the first wave of the baby boom generation, which has been labeled the Vietnam generation. Uh, get us started on this, John Henderson, if you will, and how your generation responded to the sexual revolution, to the drug revolution, to the civil rights movement, the war protest movement, and the feminist movement. Just absolutely uh, flabbergasted uh, because it was just a radical departure from uh, uh, that that very steady, calm uh, 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 approach that you'd generally been accustomed to, even though uh, there was a lot going on. But things just started happening so uh, uh, so quickly. Uh, my. <laughs> It was very interesting for me to have been uh, acculturated to a certain point. I was at uh, Xavier University in Cincinnati uh, at, at the time uh, within, within the Catholic Church to see the transition that took place 
uh, you know, one year the nuns have the long habits and all of that, and then uh, almost overnight, uh, you see that the nuns have legs, and uh, <laughs> some have some pretty legs, too, as a matter of fact. As a matter of fact, and things began to change uh, uh, all, uh, all together, and, and uh, uh, the, the, the dress began to change. Uh, the, the traditional attitude that we had uh, had uh, university in relationship to students uh, changed all, uh, uh, just all together, they had more freedoms. Well, I agree with John. Uh, I was very upset with the changes in the church, and I, I believed in the civil rights movement, because if I were the one drinking out of the different fountain, I would not like that. If I were the one who had to sit in the back of the bus, I would not like that. So I, I agreed with that part of the 60s. The rest... I really didn't like very much, the drugs and so forth. Who was it who said um, anybody who claims that he can recall the 60s clearly probably wasn't there? <laughs> <laughs> Your recollections of that time. Did you look upon the silent generation as square and sort of prematurely old-fashioned because of the value change when you came of age? Well, sure. I think you remember that old adage about you couldn't trust anyone over 30 and all of that. And then once you reach 30, <laughs> your whole perspective changed. Um, I was pretty much a young, younger, though, at the end of the 60s, early 70s. I was in high school then. But I'm thinking about the differences then and now, like going to a concert. I remember going to concerts in high school, and you had this marijuana haze when you walked into the arena. And there's nothing like that now. You can't even take bottles or anything into concerts. And so it's just everything has kind of gone from that kind of free spirit to, oh no, now it's bad for you. And a lot of the things, all these safety recalls and everything that's taken place, you know, we grew up doing all this and we were fine. So, I mean, the whole attitude has changed. Mm -hmm. We were fine, were we? <laughs> I was, I don't know about you. Uh, Jerry's Back still in, out. Uh, 1967, Time Magazine put on the cover of its edition as its man of the year, which is what it then called it, Americans under 25, which exactly excluded the silent. Boomers were the man of the year in 1967, which was the year of the summer of love. Neil, to which of these major social revolts of the 60s did the silence run towards and which did they run from? Well, it's important to remember about all generations participated in these revolts, this, this era of cultural upheaval, this great spiritual awakening that happened in America but they participated in different ways. The silent generation provided the leaders and mentors. The Chicago Seven, they were all silent. The drafters of the Port Huron Statement founded the SDS. It was silent generation people. Ken Kesey with his magic bus, he was a silent generation. The Beatles but, were silent. The Beatles were silent. Yeah. Uh, but but the, the point is, is the boomers came of age with it, okay? And they provided the passion, the emotion, the, the idealism sometimes, and uh, often the anger, and the disruptiveness, and the desire not just to reform the system, but to batter it down, to punish those who are responsible. The generation gap was where exactly the silent generation occupied. It was a war between boomers on the one hand, and their GI generation that had built this post-war edifice on the other, and the silent generation were the mediators and moderators, kind of in between, kind of siding a little bit with both sides. Absolutely. Right. Murtis, you're nodding your head, yes. Go right ahead. <laughs> I was remembering part of me was delighted in what I saw that we could never do. <laughs> uh, we didn't have enough, quote, I don't know if it was nerve or we were too polite to do. And so, uh, and also um, looking at, at that time, we were having children and wondering, they weren't at that age to participate, but wanted to maybe this would be a better place uh, when they get done. We have one of your children here. <laughs> <laughs> Mom and dad are silent? Uh-huh. How big was the generation gap because they came up on one side of all the 60s revolt and you came up on the other side of it? Well, my dad was a volunteer policeman during the riots in the 60s and uh, was very concerned about the safety of the of the issues of the you know what was going on on the on the campuses and such and um, so this was a very big thing for us we we're very much in the idea of doing what's right and what you're supposed to do and and that kind of thing and um, you know they were very concerned about the violence that was going on so 
Did you come up with different values than mom and dad? Was life one big argument on dating and sexual freedom and drug use? Well, actually, my parents probably didn't fit the mold very well. I think they thought of themselves as very progressive for their age. You know, they, they, you know, if we wanted to try to smoke, they, you know, they tried us, you know, do you, take a puff. You don't like it, don't smoke. That's fine. You know, same thing with drinking, same thing with drugs. My brother, my father came to me very sober and said, I don't want you to take drugs. This is an absolute must. But if you want to try it, you try it in my home where I have control of what you're doing and you'll be safe. Chuck, it's really interesting that uh, it, it's taken me... Uh a lifetime to find out that my father was a child abuser. Uh, <laughs> oh, because, uh, you know, when, when, when I was coming, coming up, uh, uh, the most effective discipline was for my mother to say, I'm going to tell your, your, your daddy. And uh, my daddy had a, had a corrective procedure <laughs> that, that consisted of a, of a belt, you, you, you know, and uh, that was enough to uh, restore the kind of discipline that he wanted. Uh, you know, these days, uh, families, parents are hauled into court uh, for some of the things that happened to us during, uh, during that silent generation uh, 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 development period. Okay, go. Well, actually, my mother and father were born in 1924 and 25. So I kind of was raised by almost a GI generation in a silent, um, which kind of describes why I am the way I am now. Because I identify. <laughs> <laughs> Who are you now? <laughs> I'm more of a silent, and probably by nature, than I am a, a generation Xer. Um, I tend to not like the things that the boomers did to the society, and want to return back to the the days of the silence or the days of the GI. Well, yes. take that. Yeah, I love this uh, well, break that down a little bit. What did the boomers do to society that you don't like? I was a teacher for ten, almost 10 years now. Um, I've since changed occupations because of what I, I think that the um, boomers have kind of influenced into the school system. Um, as a teacher, you want the good kids. You want the kids who are behaving themselves, who are listening, who are sitting in their chairs. Um, who are attentive and want to learn, and each, we tend to, what we end up getting in the classroom, kids who have come out of a, whose parents, I guess, came out of a generation where they wanted to be radical and push the system and um, um, kind of test the waters a lot. So you have kids now who are still under that same mentality and they're, they're constantly pushing the system and testing the waters and their, their priorities are not as much as in education as it is in getting a job, forgetting the education part of it, but making the money. You know, so... You and Mom never argued then? We actually did not argue, no, we did not. Um, I said that as a joke. <laughs> <laughs> no, we didn't argue a lot. Um, her, her way was the way. I mean, That's I respected right. her as, as, a, as, a, um, as a black woman coming up thin. She wasn't, she didn't overbear me. She didn't tell me I had to do this, that, and the other. But her, her silence, which she was very silent, spoke a lot for me and her trust for me. Thank you. Uh, silence you know what, uh, There we go. Wonderful. <laughs> There's the silence. Silence is powerful. Right. For some of us, though, from the silent generation, the 60s were very liberating. We kind of stuck within the, the law, but in our community, we did things. I did things like pass petitions for recall, pass initiative petitions, change the whole city government, and start college. So the 60s was very liberating. You me. know, it seems to me that the point that you were making earlier, Chuck, and, and the point that she is just addressing there, too, I, I agree with that. I mm -hmm. think that we found yeah. what was happening in, it, up to a certain point in the 60s very liberating. The point of demarcation often was violence. When it got to the point where uh, young people or others uh, got into where they were actually hurting people or burning down things, we, I think, most of us, uh, certainly my contemporaries and those in my family, that was the, that was the point of departure. That's where we said, uh-uh, that's one thing too many. Nick, back in 1965, a majority of the graduating class at Yale University tried to get into the Peace Corps. Oh, uh, there was a huge surge towards what were then called the helping professions, yeah. including law, which was called the helping profession back in the 60s. <laughs> I don't know why. Uh, yeah. But teaching was expanding. A lot of silent men and women were going into teaching, ministry, social service. The government was expanding. We had the war on poverty. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we had a lot of ways in which the silent were getting involved in the media and trying to help people communicate, help the younger and older people get together a little bit. And, and that defined the 1960s for the silent. And, and Neil, the point that 
that she has made, the silent women sort of reversed the cycle, didn't they? They flowered at age 40. Well, they did. Future generations. Uh, re remember, they, they got married and had kids so young, so many of them. Getting married right out of high school was often the norm. Uh, a lot of them were empty nesters in their late 40s, mid 40s even, so they didn't have any kids. So either because of divorce or because they were empty nesters, they could start whole new careers, redefine their whole identity. That's part of the midlife crisis, the female opposed to the male part. And they could become, many of them, of course, became what we now call first wave feminists with uh, Gloria Steinem and Susan Brown Miller and Kate Millett and a lot of the others that we recall from that time. Others, as, as Bill was pointing out, went from being a Mrs. to a Ms., right? And putting on business clothing. And the, the first wave silent generation <laughs> feminism emphasized rights because, you know, silence are into procedure and process and rights. And so the idea that you would have the same rights as men to pursue the same economic careers, whereas for boomers, Boomers, its feminism has been much more about values. And with uh, Xers, it's much more about just survival, right? Just getting by, even at a very young age. So each generation's definition of feminism has changed. I have a question. It's kind of like a general thing. And I'm curious how <laughs> such a dramatic difference between boomers and the silent generation. How did the silent generation, say, lose control or lose the discipline or whatever that resulted in the dramatic of the violence, the, the violence and racist, uh, the race rights and things like that. Where were the silent generation people at that point to try to get more control or to, because these are also their children too who are doing this. So I, I'm just curious about that. Yes. High school graduating class of? Me? Yeah. 84. Okay. Well, actually, the boomers who were rioting were not really the children of the silent right. at that point. They were mainly the children of the GI generation. Right. The silent at that time were in their 20s and early 30s, and they tended not to have children who were of college age. So the silent felt caught in between two very uh, uh, active and aggressive generations who had, had very different agendas back in the 1960s. This observation is perfect. The silent generation was the interpreters yes. between right. in the middle of the generation gap, sort of translating messages back and forth. I grew up having to go to Silver Springs by way of Paradise Park or to Jacksonville Beach by way of the colored beach. I used to almost get in trouble when I would sneak and drink white water because my brother would tell on me. But society did not reverberate to me my presence. I didn't stand on Jacksonville Beach until I was an adult married with children. So you see, it was during my generation that I felt like an invisible person. I knew I was here, but the silence somehow built that mobility that gave us presence. And that's why I think the silent generation is the strongest generation, because <laughs> <laughs> the silent generation was able to do it and to do it effectively. So that. ultimately, I feel like I'm just beginning to get visibility. And I'm beginning to see that this world is a better place for my children. That's because because of the silence and all the things that happen, I feel like for the first time, I too am America. We only had six bar stools. <laughs> I don't think there's any doubt that history will record that the silent generation were America's great civil rights generation. Was it you guys who wrote the silent generation is the generation with, in your words, I think, a tender social conscience, an excellent humanity, and a generation that excelled in the helping professions. Was that mm -hmm. you guys? Yes, I think that's... Is yes. that going to be their fingerprint? Yes. I think it already is. Give me an example of anything that was rationed in World War II. Gasoline. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the A yeah. sticker, three well dollars done. a week, yeah. perfect. Give us the same brief description, if you will, of the boomers. How old are they and, and what distinguishes them? The boomers are born between 1943 and 19... 
60. They are just old enough to have no, uh, or they, they fit within the period of history where they have no recollection of World War II, but they do have a recollection of the John F. Kennedy assassination. They were the ones who came of age during the consciousness revolution. And they will always be associated with the culture wars that are associated with, uh, with that time. Members of your public television station come from all generations. Please join them now with your pledge of support. We'll return to generations in just a few moments. We now return to Chuck Underwood's Generations, The Silence. I'm the daughter of G.I. Joes, um, and I guess I never thought a lot about you silence, or you silence, uh, <laughs> but my question is the cooperativeness and the fact that so many of the silence went into the so-called caring professions, were there external forces that you think contributed to those things or any particularly important ones? Uh, the silent were born into the spot between two very aggressive generations, and someone had to fill that spot. And that's often why members of the silent often refer to themselves as the sandwich generation. And they, they had to enable these two uh, noisy neighbors to uh, communicate to one another, and so it was necessary that they develop these communication skills and you look at the Phil Donahue's and you look at the development of talk radio and, and talk television shows these are silent generation inventions and it's to help people understand each other better my mom is from the silent generation and our family is very large and I'm the last of six children in the family so there's a combination of baby boomers and then here I am generation X and my mom had the opportunity to stay home while the kids were in school and by the time I entered first grade my mom had to go back to work so I became part of the latchkey uh, kids and that part of the generation and in the, and you were speaking earlier about the women who were putting the suits on and going to work and really I mean I have to applaud my mom you know for doing that I mean that took a lot of strength and courage for her especially being home for the rest of the children and I think that we can just look back upon that and I've learned a lot here today that I can look back upon to the silent generation and be really proud of that I didn't realize before nice going mom Great. <laughs> She said, already said, I had to go back to work when she was uh, in first grade. I didn't want to go back to work, and I always felt like she got cheated because I wasn't there when she got home from school to go over the homework and have hot cookies and milk and things like that. I didn't like it, but I'm still working. 20 years later, 22 years later, I'm still working. Thank you both. Now, this question, anyone on the, on the panel can answer it. Uh, being a member of Generation X, a lot of times I hear my peers saying, what does Generation X mean? Meaning like, what does the X mean? Are they categorizing us as nothing, a black hole? You know, what is, where did they get that from? Generation X originated in England, and it referred to English boomers back in the 1960s. And for about uh, two decades, it referred to alienated youth in general. In 1991, Doug Copeland wrote a book called Generation X, he took the title off of a band of uh, Billy Idols, and at the time that referred to uh, unemployed and kind of angry youth of Canada. And he applied it to refer to Americans born between 1961 and 1964 who were told by the culture and by demographers that they were boomers but who didn't feel like it. And that was around the same time that the Malcolm X movie came out, and there were a lot of X's on caps and on uh, sweatshirts and things and the X name just caught hold. By 1993, Generation X was the consensus name for uh, Americans born in the 1960s and now also the 1970s. How do the silence want to be remembered? At this stage in your life, whatever that stage might be, what's on your mind, Mertis Powell? I would like to be 
remembered as um, caring, uh, that we did make a difference, that we did bring some kind of a semblance of, um, how do I put it, uh, um, caring and, and caring about people and community uh, was very important <clears throat> to this generation, and I would hope that that would be something that we'd be known for. Uh, collectivism more than uh, individualism <coughs> and caring about the whole. John Anderson, any thoughts on how you'd like your generation to be remembered? Oh, uh, definitely. Uh, I, you know, I look upon this particular generation as perhaps the uh, chief architects of significant change in, uh, in American uh, society. Mm -hmm. Uh, whose handprints uh, uh, will perhaps be forever remembered uh, for that change, you know, that significant uh, transition from one stage to, uh, to, to another uh, that I think that ultimately will be fulfilled in having a better America, you know, yes, for, for all of us. Yeah, what does the uh, silent generation think of uh, the direction that uh, things are going now with the Gen X and the Millennium generation? Um. And a lot of the kids don't take responsibility. And I think that's because they've been brought up. There's always someone else's fault. No one takes responsibility for, for what they're doing. But I find myself also, all these kids, they ha every moment has to be filled. They walk around with their planners, and if there's something in there they're not filled, they've got to fill it up. But we do that to kids. I find myself guilty also with grandchildren now, <laughs> making sure that they go to soccer and they do all of this thing. But I think they really are organization kids. They're organized. They can't fall down and get hurt. They, uh, we, we, we met us. You can't be, kid can't be hyper, because we're given Ritalin. Kids come to school now, right now, to my university, and the first thing they do is give me, they plate their medicine up on the thing, and we're supposed to keep dosing them. So it's, it's uh, I feel kind of sorry for this, this the millennium kid right now. Well, I, I look upon things uh, with a bit of ambivalence, and uh, I, I, I guess, uh, you know, my experience at the university level, particularly uh, with current generations and even with Generation X, uh, gives me a bit of hope because uh, in spite of a lot of the negative things that, uh, that we hear about and read about, uh, I'm really uh, excited about being among so many talented and, and uh, uh, well-thinking young people. Bill Strauss and Neil Howe, wrap a ribbon around the silent generation. What has been left unsaid, what will be their legacy? Give us a big brush stroke or two. The most important footprint of the silent generation will probably be the most important footprint in all of world history. Yes. And that is Neil Armstrong's footprint on the moon. <laughs> a thousand years from now, when other generations are forgotten, there will be one footprint that we'll remember, and it will be by and of the silent generation. We learn, in retrospect, some appreciation for a generation which both had a sense of civic obligation and a sense of a community sticking together, and yet also wanted to give room for rights to the individuals and a sense of a, a liberty of expression to individuals. And that was really a balance, I think, in retrospect, we'll admire, particularly as we see these younger generations of Jeremiah's and survivalists take over. So I think that that this is a generation whose, whose legacy will be enduring and is a, is, a, is a very touching and feeling one for a lot of people. There is no such thing as a single greatest generation. All generations have their own form of greatness. I think we've discussed here today how the silent generation stands up very well against boomers and the GI generation in providing its own measure of greatness to America. Uh, the 1950s was known as the decade of the beatniks. Uh, and what did it mean when beatniks sat at the coffee shop table and... When beatniks sat in the coffee house and snapped their fingers. No idea? Mm -hmm. No. Mm -hmm. Take a guess? No. Applause. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now you remember. Uh, the GI generation. The GI generation uh, grew up early in the progressive era around World War I in the 1920s, and uh, they came of age as adults during a time of crisis, really. The Great Depression, the New Deal, World War II, 
They became known very early as a generation of team players, civic, uh, civic achievers. And even today, in their old age, we call them senior citizens. I'll tell you something interesting. As the silent generation passes age 70 and ages into those early retirement age brackets, that term is falling into disuse with the younger retirees. The silent, they're not calling themselves senior citizen. We have to invent something lighter for them, like senior partner or something, you know, <laughs> old bopper, you know, just something a little different. But senior citizen doesn't fit quite as well. And then you have the millennials, today's children and teens, who in many ways are growing up to be like what the GI generation itself was like in childhood. We are starting to see improving behavior by teenagers, falling crime rates, falling teen pregnancy, declining school violence, believe it or not. I recently read a newspaper editorial by a syndicated columnist named Kathleen Parker. Ripped it out of the newspaper right away because it instantly reminded me of the silent generation and the GI generation. And one woman in our audience made the mistake of telling me that she used to be an actress in college. So we've set her up to read part of this editorial that was written by Kathleen Parker. So I went to another country, France. I strolled the streets of Paris. I love France. I love the French. But I'm glad to be home. I think the reason I wanted to kiss the ground when we finally landed in Atlanta is because Americans are friendly, polite, considerate people who laugh easily. Americans hold doors for each other. They joke amongst themselves and strangers. They take turns, play fair, and stand in line. But best of all, Americans laugh with their bellies. My father once said, no one laughs the way Americans do, and he was right. Compared to other cultures, our history may be brief, our architecture little more than tornado bait, <laughs> and our food a tad quick. <laughs> but American culture is characterized by a spirit of goodness, optimism, and generosity you don't find anywhere else in this world. And no one laughs the way Americans laugh. It's useful now and then to be reminded of that. Nice job. Good job. Thank you. Silent Generation, we love you. We uh, are honored by the achievements of your generation and those who came before. And hopefully in today's program, we've maybe learned a little bit about the burden on the generations that are coming up and how hard and decent we need to work to solve the problems that are still around. Thank you all very much. Chuck Underwood's Generations is made possible in part by United Healthcare, proud to be a resource for pertinent healthcare information. United Healthcare provides benefit plan and healthcare information at uhc.com.